This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, let's uh, get started. So, today uh, it's uh, really uh, a great opportunity for all of us uh, to have a uh, guest lecturer, one of the leaders in uh, robotics vision, uh, Gregory Hager from uh, Johns Hopkins, who will be uh, giving uh, uh, this uh, guest uh, lecture. And um, on uh, Monday, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, on Wednesday, we have uh, the midterm in class. Uh, tonight and tomorrow, we have uh, the review sessions, so I think everyone uh, has signed uh, on for those sessions. And uh, next Wednesday, uh, the lecture will be given by uh, a former uh, PhD student from Stanford University, uh, Krasi Korolov, who uh, will be giving the lecture on trajectories and uh, inverse kinematics. So, welcome, Craig. Thank you. So it, it is a pleasure to be here today, and, and thank you, Osama, for inviting me. Um, so Osama told me he'd like me to spend a lecture talking about vision. Uh, and um, as you might guess, that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, at last count, there, was, there were a few over 1,000 papers in computer vision in peer-reviewed conferences and journals last year. So summarizing all those in one lecture is, is a bit more than I can manage to do. But what I thought I would do is try to focus it specifically on an area that I've been interested in for really quite a long time, namely, what is the perception and sensing you need to really build a system that has both manipulation and mobility uh, capabilities? And so really this whole lecture has been designed to give you a taste of what I think the main components are, and also to give you a sense of what the current state of the art is. And again, it's obviously with the number of papers produced every year, defining the state of the art is difficult, but at least give you a sense of how to evaluate the work that's out there and how you might be able to use it uh, in a, um, a robotic environment. And so really, I, I want to think of it as answering just a few questions or looking at how perception could answer a few questions. So the simplest question you might imagine trying to answer is, uh, where am I relative to the things around me? I, you, know, you turn a robot on, it has to figure out where it is, and in particular be able to move without running into things, be able to perform potentially some useful tasks that involves uh, mobility. The next step up, once you've decided where things are, is you'd actually like to be able to identify where you are and what the things are in the environment. Clearly the first step toward being able to do something useful in the environment is understanding the things around you and what you might be able to do with them. The third question is, once I know what the things are, how do I interact with them? So there's a big difference between being able to walk around and not bump into things and being able to actually s safely reach out and touch something and be able to manipulate it in some interesting way. And then really the last question, which I'm not going to talk about today, is how do I actually think about solving new problems that uh, in some sense were unforeseen? by the original designer of the system. So it's one thing to build a materials handling robot where you've programmed it to deal with the five objects that you can imagine coming down the conveyor line. It's another thing to put a robot down in the middle of a kitchen and say, here's a table, clear the table, including china, dinnerware, uh, glasses, boxes, things that it potentially has never seen before and needs to be able to manipulate safely. That, I think, is, is a problem I, I won't touch on today, but at least I'll, I'll give some suggestions as to where the, the problems lie. So I should say, um, again, I'm going to really breeze through a lot of material quickly, but at the same time, this is a class, obviously. If you're interested in something, if you have a question, uh, if I'm mumbling and you can't understand me, just stop and uh, we'll go back and talk in more depth about whatever I just covered. So with that, um, 
the topics I've chosen today, uh, really in many ways from bottom, if you will, to top, from low level capabilities to higher level, are first computational stereo, a way of getting the geometry of the environment around you. Feature detection and matching, a way of starting to identify objects and identify where you are. And motion tracking and visual feedback, how do you actually use information from vision to manipulate the world. And again, the, I think the, the applications of those particular modules are fairly obvious in robotic uh, mobility and manipulation. So uh, again, let me just dive right in. Um, I don't know, actually, how many people here have taken or are taking the computer vision course that is being taught? Okay, so a few people. For you, this will be a review. Uh, you can, I guess, hopefully bone up for the midterm whenever that's going to happen or something. Um, and hopefully I don't say anything that um, disagrees with anything that uh, Jana has taught you. But um, so what is computational stereo? Well, computational stereo, quite simply, is a phenomena that you're all very familiar with. It's the fact that if you have two light sensing uh, devices, eyes, cameras, uh, and you view the same physical point in space, and there's a physical separation between those viewpoints, you can now solve a triangulation problem. I can determine how far something is from the viewing sensors by finding this point in both images and then simply solving a geometric triangulation problem. Simple. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, there's a lot of stereo going on in this room. Uh, pretty much everybody uh, has stereo, although oddly about 10% of the population is stereo blind for one reason or another. So it turns out that you know, in this room, there are probably three or four of you who actually don't do stereo, but you compensate in other ways. Um, even so, uh, having stereo, particularly in a uh, robotic system, would be a huge step forward. Sorry for the colors there. Didn't realize it had transposed them. Um, so when you're solving a stereo problem in computer vision, there are really three core problems. Uh, the first problem is one of calibration. In order to solve the triangulation problem, I need to know where the sensors are in space relative to each other. A matching problem. So remember, in stereo, what I'm presented with is a pair of images. Now, those images can vary in many different ways. Hopefully, they contain common content. What I need to do is to find the common content, even though there is variation between the images. And then finally, reconstruction. Once I've actually performed the matching, now I can reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional uh, space that I'm surrounded by. And so I'll, I'll talk just briefly about uh, all three of those. So first, um, calibration. So again, why do we calibrate? Well, we calibrate for actually any number of reasons. Uh, most important is that we have to characterize the sensing devices. So in particular, if you think about an image, uh, you're getting information in pixels. So if you say that there's some point in an image, it's got a pixel location. It's just a set of numbers at a particular location. What you're interested in ultimately is computing distance to something in the world. Well, pixels are one unit. Distances are a different unit. Clearly, you need to be able to convert between those two. So typically in a camera, there are four important numbers that we use to convert between them. Two scale factors that convert from pixels to millimeters and two point two uh, numbers that characterize the center of projection in the image. So the good news for you is that uh, there are a number of good toolkits out there that let you do this calibration. Uh, they let you characterize what's called the intrinsic or internal parameters of the camera. In addition, we need to know the relationship of the two cameras to each other. That's often called the extrinsic or external calibration. That's also something that you can get very good toolkits to solve. Uh, there's a toolkit for MATLAB, in fact that um, solves that quite well. So calibration really is just getting the geometry of the system. So we're set up and we're ready to go. Now, for um, the current purposes, let's assume that we happen to have a very special geometry. So our special geometry is going to be a pair of cameras that are parallel to each other, and the image planes are coplanar, and in fact, the scan lines are perfectly aligned with each other. So if I look at a point in the left image, if I wanted to find the same corresponding point in the right image of some physical point in the world, it's going to be on the same row. And in fact, that's going to be true for all the rows of the camera. So it's a, it's a really convenient way to, um, to think about cameras for the moment. So for a camera system like that, 
solving the, the stereo problem really is, uh, from a geometric sense, quite simple. So what did I say? I've got a point on one camera line. I've got a point in another camera. The other camera, the same line. What I can do is effectively solve triangulation by computing the difference in the coordinates between those two points. Um, again, not to go into great detail, but I can write down the equations of perspective projection, which I've done here for two cameras, for what I call now the x-coordinate. So in fact, um, on this last slide, I, don't, I forgot to point it out, but I'm going to use a coordinate system, in fact, through this talk, which is x going to the right, y going down in the image, and I guess uh, most of you should be able to figure out which direction z goes once I've told you those two things, right? Where does z go? Out the camera. So z is heading straight out of the camera lens. So that's the coordinate system we're going to be dealing with. So the things that we can find fairly easily in some sense are the x and y's of the point. The unknown is the z. So whenever I say depth, you can think of I'm trying to compute the z's. So I can write down perspective projection for a left camera and a right camera, which I've done here. They are offset by some baseline, which I've called B. I've also got the Y projection, but it turns out to be the same for both cameras because I've scan line aligned them. So I've got three numbers, XL, XR, and Y. I've got three unknowns, X, Y, and Z. A little algebra allows us to solve for the uh, depth, Z as a function of disparity, which again is the difference between the two coordinates, the baseline of the camera, and this internal scaling factor, which, which um, allows us to go from pixels to millimeters. Just a couple things to notice about this. Depth is inversely proportional to disparity. So the larger the disparity, the smaller the depth. Makes sense. I get closer. I, my eyes have to keep going like this more and more and more to be able to see something. Uh, it's proportional to the baseline. If I could pull my eyes out of my head and spread them apart, I could get better accuracy. And it's also proportional to the resolution of the imaging system. So if you put all that together, um, you can start to actually think about designing stereo systems from very small to very large that operate at different distances and with different accuracies. The other thing to point out here is that um, depth being inversely proportional to disparity means that close to the camera, we actually get very good depth resolution. As we get further and further away, our ability to resolve depth by disparity goes down drastically. You see out here, you know, at a distance of 10 meters, one disparity level is already tens, maybe even hundreds of centimeters of distance. So stereo is actually good in here. It, it's very hard out there. And in fact, anybody happen to know the human stereo system, what its optimal operating point is? Anybody had a class where they talk about that? It's right about here. It's about 18 inches from your nose. Right in this point, you have great stereo acuity. You get in here and your eyes start to hurt. You get out here past about an arm length and it just turns off. You actually don't use stereo at long distances. You're really just using it in this workspace. And of course, it makes sense. We're trying to manipulate, right? Well, I made a, a strong assumption about the cameras. I said that they had this very special geometry. And back in the good old days, when I was your age, um, these are, those are the good days, by the way, just so you're all aware of that fact. <laughs> you're in the good days right now. Enjoy them. Back in the good old days, we actually used to try to build camera systems that um, had this geometry. Um, because if you start to change that geometry, you no longer get this nice scan line property. So in fact, if I rotate the cameras inward, if I start to look at the relationship between corresponding points, I start to get these rays coming out. So if I pick a point here, the line is now some slanted line. Well, it turns out, luckily, one of the things that's really been nailed down in the last uh, decade or two is that that doesn't matter. We can always take a stereo pair that looks like this, and we can resample the images so it's a stereo pair that looks like that. And in fact, by doing this calibration process, we get it. So the good news is I can almost always think about the cameras being these very special scan line to line cameras. And so everything I'm going to say from now on is going to um, pretty much rely on the fact that I've done this so-called rectification process. So again, a very nice abstraction. I'll just point out, again, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but um, the relationship that I just described. So how do I, if I have a point in one camera, how do I know the line to look for it on the second camera? 
Well, it's a function of the relationship, the rotation and the translation between the two cameras. And it turns out, this is again something that really has been nailed down in the last uh, couple of decades, I can estimate this from images. So in fact, I could literally take a pair of cameras, put them in this room, do some work, and I could figure out their geometric relationship without having any special apparatus whatsoever. What it also means is instead of doing stereo, I could literally just take a video camera and walk like this, process the video images, and effectively do stereo from a single camera using the video. And that's because I can estimate this matrix E and that relationship up there, uh, which if we worked out what E was, it turns out to contain the rotation and translation between the two camera systems. And once I know that, I can do my rectification and I can do stereo. So actually stereo is very, a special case in some sense of taking uh, a video and processing it to get motion and uh, structure at the same time. So again, that's a whole lecture. We won't go in there, but suffice to say that from a geometric point of view, we can actually deal with cameras now in a very general way with relatively little a priori assumptions about how they start. Okay, so geometry calibration is done. I now want to reconstruct. But to do reconstruction, I need to do matching. I need to look at a pair of images and say, hey, there's a point here and that same point is over there and I want to solve the triangulation problem. So there are two major approaches, feature-based and region-based matching. So feature-based obviously depends on features. I could run an edge detector in this room. I could find some nice edges, you know, the chairs, the edge of people, the floor, and then I could try to match these features between images. And now for every feature, I'm going to get depth. So if you do that, you end up with these kind of little stick figure type uh, cartoons here. So here's a, a set of bookshelves, and this is a result of running a feature-based stereo algorithm on that. So you can see on the one hand, it's actually giving you kind of the right representation, right? The, the major structures here are the shelves, and it's finding the shelves. But you notice that you don't get any other structure. You're just getting those features that you happen to pull out of the image. So the other approach is to say, forget about features. Let me try to find a match for every pixel in the image, a so-called dense depth map. Every pixel's got to have some matching pixel, or at least up to some occlusion relationships. So let's just look for them and try to find them. And so this is a so-called region matching method. I'm going to actually pick a pixel plus a support region, try to find the matching region in, in another image. And uh, this has been a cottage industry for a very long time. And uh, so people pick their favorite ways of matching, their favorite algorithms to apply to those matches, and so on and so forth. So again, a, a huge literature in doing that. Um, there are a few, al a few match metrics which have come to be used fairly wi widely. Probably the most common one is something called the sum of absolute differences. It's uh, right up there. Um, or more generally, uh, I've got something called zero mean SAD or sum of absolute differences. And that's probably the most widely used algorithm, not the least of which because it's very easy to implement in hardware and it's very fast to operate. So you take a region, you take the difference, take a region, take a region, take their difference, take their absolute value, sum those, and assume if they match that that difference is going to be small. If they don't match, it's going to be big. All the other metrics I have up here are really different variations on that theme of take this region, take that region, compare them, and try to minimize or maximize some measure. So if I have a match measure, now I can look at correspondence. Again, I get to use the fact that things are scan line to line. So when I pick a point in the left image or a pixel in the left image, I know I'm just going to look along a single line in the right image, not the whole image. So simple algorithm. Uh, for every row, for every column, for every disparity, so for every distance that I'm going to consider essentially, uh, I'm now going to compute my match metric in some window. I'll record it. Uh, if it happens to be better than the best match I found for this pixel, I'll, sorry, if it's better than the best match I found for this pixel, I'll record it. If not, uh, I just go around and try the next disparity. So. You work this out, what's, how much computing are you doing? Well, it's every pixel, rows and columns, every disparity. So um, for example, for my eyes, 
if I'm trying to compute on kind of canonical images over a good working range, you know, three feet to a foot, maybe 100 disparities, 120 disparities. So rows, columns, 120 disparities, size of the window, which might be, let's say, 11 by 11 pixels. It's a pretty common number. So there's a lot of computing in this algorithm, a lot, a lot of computing. And in fact, up until maybe 10 years ago, even just running a stereo algorithm was a, a, a feat. Just point out that it turns out that the way I just described that algorithm, although intuitive, is actually not the way that most people would implement it. There's a slightly better way to do it. This is literally MATLAB code. So um, for anybody in computer vision, this is the MATLAB to compute stereo on an image. Um, and you can see the main thing is I'm actually looping first over the disparities, and then I'm looping over effectively rows and columns, doing them all at once. The reason for doing this without going into details is you actually save a huge number of operations in the image. So if you ever do implement stereo, and I know there are some people in this room who are interested in it, don't ever do this. It's the wrong thing to do. Do it this way. It's, it's the right way to do it. And if you do this, you can actually get pretty good performance out of the system. Just one last twist to this. So one of the things that's going to happen if you ever do this is it's gonna, you're going to be happy because it's going to work reasonably well, probably pretty quickly. And then you're going to be unhappy because you're going to see it's going to work well in a few places and it's not going to work in other places. Uh, someone in computer vision, can you give me an example of a place where this algorithm is not going to work? Or unli is unlikely to work? A situation. Very simple situation. Rotating. I'm sorry? Rotating. I can't hear you. Rotating. Well, it's the, but I'm assuming rectification, so. Uh, yeah, the boundaries are going to be a problem, right? Because I'm going to get occlusion relationships will change the pixels, so that's good. Occlusions are bad. How about this? I look at a white sheet of paper. What am I going to be able to match between the two images? Almost nothing. Right? So you put a stereo algorithm in this room, it's going to do great on the chairs, except at the boundaries. Uh, but there's this nice white wall back there, and there's nothing to match. So it's not going to work everywhere. It's only going to work in a few places. How can you tell when it's working? You know, it's one thing to have an algorithm that does something reasonable. It's another to know when it's actually working. Uh, and the answer turns out to be a simple check is I can match from left to right, and I can match from right to left. Now, if the system's working right, they should both give the same answer, right? It's, I can match from here to here, or here to here. It shouldn't make any difference. Well, when, the right, when you have good structure to the image, that will be the case. But if you don't have good structure to the image, it turns out you usually are just getting random answers. And so I said something like 100 disparities, right? So the odds that you pick the same number twice out of 100 is really pretty small. And so it turns out that almost always the disparities differ, and you can detect that fact. And it's called the left-right check. Uh, on a multi-core processor, it's great because you have one core doing left to right, one core doing right to left. At the end, they just meet up, and you check their answers. Here's some disparity maps. Uh, these are actually taken from an article by Cork and Banks uh, some years ago, just comparing different metrics. Uh, and here I just happen to have two. One is so-called SSD, sum of squared differences. The other is uh, zero mean normalized cross-correlation. A um, couple of just quick things to point out. So like on the top images, you can see that the two metrics that they chose did about the same. You can also see that you're only getting about maybe 50% data density. So again, they've done the left-right check. Half the data is bad. So kind of another thing to keep in mind, 50% good data. Not 100%, not 20% either. 50% good data, maybe. Second row, why is there such a difference here? Well, there's a brightness difference. I don't know if you can see, but the right image is darker than the left. Well, if you're just matching pixels, that brightness difference shows up as uh, just a difference it's trying to account for. In the right column, they've taken so-called zero meaning. They've subtracted the mean of the neighborhood of the pixels gets rid of brightness differences, pulls them into uh, better alignment in the brightness range, and so they get much better density. And this is just an artificial scene. I think the most interesting thing there is it's an artificial scene. You've got perfect photometric data, and it still doesn't do perfectly because of these big areas where there's no texture.
and it doesn't know what to do. So it's producing random answers. The left-right check throws it out. So the left-right check uh, does not have any guarantees? There are no guarantees, that's correct. It could make a mistake, but the odds that it makes a mistake, it turns out, are quite small. It actually is, it, I should say, it's a very reliable measure because usually it's going to pick the wrong pixels. Occasionally, by chance, it'll say yes, but those will be isolated pixels, typically. Usually, if you're making a mistake, you don't make a mistake on a pixel, you make a mistake on an area. And what you're trying to do is to really kind of throw that area away. But a good point. It will, it's not perfect. But actually, in the world of vision, it's one of the nicer things that you get for almost free. I'll just say that um, these days, uh, a lot of what you see out there is real-time stereo. So starting really about 10 years ago, people realized if they're smart about how they implement the algorithms, they can start to get close to real-time. Now you can buy systems that run pretty much in software and produce 30 frames a second stereo data. Now, it's kind of a, just a mention that, you know, I said that the data is not perfect. Well, the data is not perfect. And as a result, if you could imagine what you'd like to do is take stereo and build a geometric model, right? I'd like to do manipulation. I want to take this pan, I want to have a 3D model, and then I want to generate or manipulate 3D. Well, you saw those images. Stereo typically doesn't produce data that's good enough to give you high precision, completely dense 3D models. It's an interesting research problem. In fact, people are working on it. But it's a great modality if you just want a kind of rough 3D description of the world. And you can run it in real time, and you're now getting kind of real time coarse 3D. And so I think that's why right now real time stereo is really getting a lot of interest, because it gives you this coarse, wide field 3D data, 30 frames a second, that lets you just do interesting things. I just thought I would throw in one example of what you can do. So this is actually something we did uh, 10 years ago, I guess. You're a mobile robot, and you want to detect obstacles, and you're running on a floor. So what's an obstacle, well, it's a positive obstacle, something that I'm going to run into, or it could be a negative obstacle. You know, I'm coming to the edge of the stairs, and I don't want to fall down the stairs. So I'm going to use stereo to do this. And so the, the main observation is that since I assumed I'm more or less operating on a floor, I've got a ground plane. And it turns out planar structures in the world are effectively planar structures in disparity space. So it's very easy to detect this big plane and to remove it. And once you've removed that big plane, anything that's left has got to be an obstacle, positive or negative. Doesn't matter what it is. So you run stereo, you remove the ground plane. If there's something left, that's something you want to worry about avoiding. So here's a, a little video showing this. So there's a real-time stereo system. So first we put down something that's an obstacle. It shows up. Here's something which, if you were just doing something like background subtraction, you might say that that newspaper is an obstacle. It's different than the floor, right? So you would drive around it, because it, it could be something you don't run, run into. But here, since we've got this ground plane removal going, we can see that this is very clearly an obstacle. That is very clearly something that's just attached to the floor and disappears, and you can go by it. And this is something real cheap, easy, simple to implement. And I think that really is the great value of stereo and robotics right now, today, is that most stereo algorithms can give you this core sense of what's around you and where you're going, and you can use it for downstream computations. In the world of stereo and research, there are a lot of other issues that people are trying to deal with. How do you increase the density, increase the precision, deal with photometric issues like shiny objects, deal with uh, these differences between the images just due to brightness, um, lack of texture, how do I deal with the fact that in some places I don't have lack of texture, how do I infer some sort of depth there, and also geometric ambiguities like occlusion boundaries, how do I deal with the fact that occasionally there'll be parts of the image that the left camera sees and the right camera doesn't see. So there's ongoing research there. Most of these methods, I'll just say, try to solve stereo not as this local region matching problem I mentioned, but as a global optimization problem. And so there's a lot of work in different uh, global optimization algorithms. And you know, there is hope that ultimately stereo will get to the point that it really can do um, the sort of thing I mentioned. I want to pick this up, and I really want to get a 3D model 
and use that for manipulation. Probably not there today. I should just say that there's one simple way to get a huge performance boost out of your stereo algorithm, something that people often do. And if anybody can guess uh, one way to just take a stereo algorithm and make it work a whole lot better. Think about like how I could change this sheet of paper to be something that I could actually do matching on. Texture. You want to add texture. How could you add texture? Project light. There you go. Just put a little light projector on the top of your stereo system and you'll be amazed at uh, how well it works. Suddenly, this thing which you couldn't match before becomes the world's best place to do stereo because you get to choose the texture and you get to um, match it. So um, that's the other thing that people have looked a lot into. You'll see in the literature, structured light stereo is another way to get better performance out of stereo. Okay, so that's stereo. Again, the message here is by using two cameras, you can get, at this point, data density and accuracy that still exceeds pretty much anything else you could imagine in the laser range finding world. Um, it's not as reliable as laser range finding, and that's probably the thing that is still the, the, the main topic of research. Any quick questions on that before I shift gears? Okay, so I'm a robot. I'm running around. I've got real-time stereo. I don't run into things anymore. If somebody walks in front of me, I scurry away as quickly as I can so that I don't hurt them. But I have no clue where I am in the world. Or I have no clue what's in the world around me. So if you said, you know, go over to the printer and get my print out, you know, where is the printer? Where am I? Where's your office? Who are you? So how can we solve those problems? And in fact, this, I think, is an area of computer vision that I would say in the last decade has undergone a true revolution. Ten years ago, if I would have talked about object recognition in this lecture, we really had no clue. There were kind of some interesting things going on in the field, but we had no clue. And today, there are people who would claim that at least certain classes of object recognition problems are solved problems. We actually know very well how to build solutions, and there are actually commercial solutions out there. So what is the problem with object recognition? Well, it's a chicken and egg problem. If I want to recognize an object, there are many unknowns. So I look at an image. I don't know the identity of the object. I don't know where it is. And most importantly, perhaps, I don't know what's, what's being presented to me. So I don't happen to have a, oh, here we go. So, you know, if I say, recognize, find my cell phone in the image, you don't know if you're going to see the front of the cell phone, the back of the cell phone, the top of the cell phone. You don't know if you're going to see half of the cell phone hidden behind something else. You don't know what the lighting on the cell phone is going to be. Huge unknowns in the appearance, let alone then finding it in the image and segmenting it and then actually doing the identification. So there's a sense in which if I could segment the object, if I could say here's where the object is in the image, then solving recognition and pose would be fairly easy. Or if I told you the pose of the object, solving segmentation and recognition would be easy to do. Or if I tell you what the object is, finding it and figuring out its pose is easy to do. Doing all of them at the same time is hard. So for a long time, people tried to use geometry. So maybe the right thing to do is to have a 3D model of my cell phone and to use my stereo vision to recognize it. Well, we just said stereo is not real reliable, right? Probably not good enough to recognize objects. So another set of people will said, well, how about if we recognize it from appearance? So let's just take pictures. You know, the way I'm going to recognize my cell phone is I've just got 30 pictures of my cell phone and you find it in the image. So um, you can do that and in fact, you can see here, this is some work of Sri Nair about uh, 10 years ago. Um, they're doing pretty well on a database of about 100 objects. But you notice some other things, um, not in the database. Um, black background. The objects actually only have, in this case, one degree of freedom. It's rotation in the plane. So yes, they've got 100 objects, but the number of pictures, that, or the number of images they can see is fairly small. No occlusion, no real change in lighting. So this is interesting. You know, in some sense, it generated a lot of excitement because it's probably the first system that could ever do 100 objects. But it did it in this very limited circumstance. And so the question was, well, how do we 
how do we bridge that gap? How do we get from hundreds to thousands and do it in the real world? And really the answer, you can almost think of it as combining both the geometry and the uh, appearance-based approach. So the observation is that views were a very strong constraint. Giving you all these different views and recognizing from views worked for 100 objects. But it's just hard to predict a complete view. It's hard to predict what part of the cell phone I'm going to see. It's hard to get enough images of it to be representative. It still doesn't solve the problem of occlusion if I don't see the whole thing. So views seem to be in the right direction, just not quite there. So um, Cordelia Schmidt did a thesis in 1997 with Roger Moore where she tried a slightly different approach. She said, well, what if instead of storing complete views, we store, think of it as interesting aspects of an object. You know, if you were going to store a face, what are the interesting aspects? Well, there are things like the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. You know, the cheeks are probably not that interesting. There's not much information there. Um, but the eyes and the nose and the mouth, they tell you a lot. Or, you know, my cell phone, you've got all sorts of little textures. So what if we just store, if you think of it this way, thumbnails of an object. So my cell phone is not a bunch of images, it's a few thousand thumbnails. And now suppose that I can make that feature detection process very repeatable. So if I show you my cell phone in lots of different ways, you get the same features back every time. Now suddenly things start to look interesting because what the signature of an object is not the image, but it's these thumbnails. And I don't have to have all the thumbnails. You know, if I get half the thumbnails, maybe I'll be just fine. If the thumbnails don't care about rotation in the plane, that's good. If they don't care about scale, even better. So it really it starts to become a doable approach. And in fact, this is really what has revolutionized this area. And in particular, there is a set of features called SIFT, Scale Invariant Feature Transform, which I know you've learned about in computer vision, if you've had it, uh, developed by David Lowe, which really have become pretty much the industry standard at this point. In fact, you can download this from his website and build your own object recognition system if you want. Let me just um, talk a little bit about a few details of the approach. So I said features is, is where we want to go. Well, the two things that we need to get good features, one is we need good detection repeatability. I need a way of saying there are features on this wall at this orientation, features on this wall at this orientation. I should find the same features. So detection has to be invariant to image transformations. And I have to represent these features somehow. And probably just using a little thumbnail is not the best way to go, right? Because a thumbnail, if I take my <coughs> cell phone and I rotate a little bit out of plane, or I rotate even in plane, the image changes a lot. And I'd like to not have to represent every possible appearance of my cell phone under every possible orientation. So um, we need to represent them in a coordinate invariant way, and we need lots of them. And when I say lots, I don't mean 10. I mean 1,000. We want lots of them. So SIFT features solve this problem. They do it in the following way. They do a set of filtering operations to find features that are invariant to, the detection is invariant to rotation and scale. It does a localization process to find a very precise location for it. It assigns an orientation to the feature. So now if I redetect it, I can always assign the same orientation to that feature and cancel for rotations in the image. Builds a key point descriptor out of this information, and a typical image yields about 2,000 stable features. Uh, and in, there's some evidence that suggests to recognize an object like my cell phone, you only need three to six of them. So from a few thousand features, you only need one or two percent, and you're there. So again, just uh, briefly, the steps, a set of filtering operations, what they're trying to do is to find features that have both a local structure that's a maximum of an objective function and a size or a scale that's a maximum of an objective function. So they're really doing a three-dimensional search for a maximum. Once they have that, they say, aha, this area is a feature. 
key point descriptors, what they do is they compute the so-called gradient structure of the image. So this allows them to assign, assign a direction to features. And so again, by, getting, by having an assigned orientation, they can get rid of uh, rotation in the image. So if you do that, and you run it on an image, you get uh, confusing figures like this. What they've done is they've drawn a little arrow in this image for every detected feature. So you can think of a long arrow as being a big feature, so a large scale feature, and small arrows being fine, detailed features. And the direction of the arrow is this orientation assignment that they give. And so you can see in this house picture, uh, it's not even that high res picture, it's 233 by 189. And they've got 832 original key points filtered down to 536 when they did a little bit of <coughs> throwing out what they thought were bad features. So lots of features, lots of information that's being memorized, but discreetly now. Not the whole image, just discreetly. If you take those features and you try to match features, it turns out also they're very discriminative. So if I look at the difference in match value between two features that do match and two features that don't match, it's about a factor of two, typically. And so there's enough signal there, you can actually get matches pretty reliably. Now I mentioned geometry. So right now, a, an object would just be a suitcase of features. So if I were going to memorize my cell phone, I just said I gave you some thumbnails. So most systems actually build that into a view. So I don't just say my cell phone is just a bag of features, but it's a bag of features with some spatial relationship among them. And so now if I match a feature up here, it tells me something about what to expect about features down there. Or more generally, if I see a bunch of feature matches, I can now try to compute an object pose that's consistent with all of them. And so in fact, that's how the feature matching works. It uses something called the Huff transform, which you can think of as a voting technique. Just generally, voting is a good thing. I'll just say as an aside, this whole thing that I've been talking about, all we're trying to do is to set up voting. You know, so, and we're really trying to be in an election where we're not going down to the August convention to make a decision of who's winning the primaries. This is an election that we want to win on the first try. So these features are very good features. They do very discriminative matching of objects. You add a little bit of geometry and suddenly, from a few feature matches, you're getting pose and identity of an object from a very small amount of information. So here are a couple of results. This is from David Lowe's original paper. So um, you can see there's just a couple objects here, a little toy train and a froggy. Uh, and there's the scene. And you know, if you just are given that center image, I think even a person has to look a little bit before you find the froggy and the toy train. And on the right are the detected froggy and toy train, including uh, a froggy that's been almost completely hidden behind that uh, dark black object. You just see his front flipper and his back flipper, but you don't see anything else. And the system's actually detected, in this case, two instances, I think. It, well, no, actually, it's one, one box. So it got one instance. It even got, got it realized that even though it was occluded, it's one object out there. So, I mean, these, again, I think it's fair to say are fairly remarkable results considering where the field was at that time. Since then, there's been a cottage industry of how can we make this better, faster, higher, stronger. So, um, this happens to be work by Ponce, uh, Ponce and Rothganger, where they tried to extend it by using better geometric models and slightly richer features. So, they have 51 objects. Uh, and they can have any number of objects in a scene. And this is the sort of uh, recognition plots that you're starting to see now. So, you know, we're not talking about getting it right 60% of the time or 70% of the time. They're getting 90 plus percent recognition rates on these objects. Now, of course, I've been talking about object recognition. Just point out that <coughs> You can think of object recognition as there's an object in front of me and I want to know its identity and its pose. Or you can think of the object as the world and I want to know my pose inside this big object called the world. And so, for example, if I'm outside, I might see a few interesting landmarks and recognize or remember those landmarks. 
using features. And now when I drive around the world, I'll go and I'll look for those same features again and use them to decide where I am. And so in fact, this is, um, again, work out of UBC, where they're literally using that same method to model the world, recognize, you know, I'm in this room, I see a bunch of features. I go out in the hallway, I see a bunch of features. I go in the AI lab, I see a bunch of features. Store all those features, and now as I'm driving around in the world, I look for things that I recognize. If I see it, then I know where I am relative to where I was before. Moreover, remember I said that for stereo to get geometry, we didn't have to actually calibrate our stereo system. We could have one camera and it could just walk around. We could compute this so-called epipolar geometry automatically and then we could do stereo. So in fact, what they've done in this map is they've, from one camera as they're driving around, they're not computing just the identity but the geometry of all these features around them. So they can build a real 3D map, just like you'd build with a laser rangefinder, but now just by matching features and images. And in fact, we edited a joint issue of uh, IJCV and IJRR about, I guess, six, eight months ago. And probably half the papers in that special issue ended up being, how can you use this technique to map the world in different variations and flavors? So again, it's, it's a technique which really, in many ways, is there. You can download it from the web practically and put it on your mobile robot and make it run. And in fact, this is my favorite um, result. So um, <clears throat> this is the work of Ryan Eustace, who uh, was a postdoc at Hopkins uh, with Lewis Whitcomb, who does a lot of underwater robotics. And so this is the Titanic. This is actually a Ballard expedition where they flew over the Titanic with a camera. And um, the goal was obviously to get a nice set of images of the t Titanic. But the problem is that underwater, it's really difficult to do very precise localization and odometry. And so what Ryan did is he took these techniques and he built effectively a mapping system, very high precision mapping system, that was able to take these images, use the images to localize the underwater robot, and then put the images together into a mosaic. And so this is a mosaic of the Titanic as they flew over it. Uh, you can see the numbers up there. They actually ran for about 3.1 kilometers. They have, what is it, uh, how many images? There it is, over 3,000 images, 3,500 images. Matched successfully, computed the motion of the robot successfully, filtered all this together, and were able to produce this mosaic. So really an impressive, impressive system. They actually have, um, so from this they actually do get the 3D geometry. I mean, in this mosaic, they've, they've basically projected it down. But they are computing uh, up to the set of features that they're able to use, the, the 3D geometry. And actually, the little red versus brown up there, <coughs> the red, I believe, is the original odometry that they thought they had on the robot. And the brown is actually the corrected odometry um, that they computed or vice versa, I don't know which is which now. I can't remember if they did the two separate pieces or they did just one piece. But really impressive work, very nice. Also, uh, it mentions here doing a Kalman filter. That he built a special purpose Kalman filter that operated on the space of um, reconstructed images. So, um, that is kind of the next piece of this puzzle. I'll just, I guess I had one other thing in here. So a lot of people are interested in 3D now. So this is Peter Allen um, also putting together images. Here he's just showing the range data, but you can imagine if you have range and appearance, now you can actually do interesting things using both 3D and appearance information. And I know there's some work going on here at Stanford in that also. So <coughs> that's kind of chapter two. So now a set of techniques that not only let me avoid running into things in the world, but a set of techniques that let me say, well, where am I? And where are some things that I'm interested in? So you can now actually imagine phrasing the problem, I want to pick up the cell phone. And you could actually have a system that recognizes the cell phone and is able to say, hey, there's the thing that I want to pick up. So I'll just finish up 
with what I thought was the last piece of this puzzle, namely, how do I pick it up? Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to pick it up. There's a lot of interesting and hard problems in figuring out how to put my fingers on this object to actually pick it up. But at least let's talk a little bit about the hand-eye coordination it takes for me to actually reach over and grab this thing. Or even better, if I do that, I don't want to drop this. Um, if I do that, um, how do I actually catch it again? Which luckily I did. Otherwise, it'd be a very sad lecture. So um, I'm going to talk about this in two pieces. So one piece is going to be uh, visual tracking. So we're now really moving to the domain where I want to think about moving objects in the world and having precise information about how they're moving, how they're changing. So visual tracking is an area that attacks that problem. And I know you saw a video maybe a week ago of a humanoid robot that was playing um, badminton or ping pong or volleyball, volleyball I think it was. And so I, I think uh, Professor Khatib had already explained that you know, they're doing some simple visual tracking of this big colored thing coming at them and they're using that to, to do the feedback. Well, so big colored things are nice. Uh, unfortunately, my cell phone is not day glow orange, so it's hard to just use color as the only thing that you can deal with. But tracking has been you know, a problem of interest for a long time. Tracking people, tracking faces, tracking expressions, um, all sorts of different tracking. So what I think is interesting is first to say, well, what do you mean by tracking to begin with? It's kind of cool to write a paper that says tracking of X, but no one's ever defined what tracking is. So I have a, a very simple definition of visual tracking, which simply says, um, I'm going to start out with a target. You know, my face is going to be the, the canonical target here. So at time zero, for some reason, you've decided that's the thing you want to track. And the game in town is to know something about where it is at time t. And the something about where it is is something is what you, in principle, get to pick. So there's going to be a configuration space for this object. You know, I could, the simplest thing is your big uh, orange ball. It's just round, so it's got no orientation. It just has a position in the image. So its configuration is just where the heck is the, the orange ball. But you can imagine, you know, my cell phone has an orientation. So presumably orientation might be part of the configuration. Or if I start to rotate out of plane, you get those out of plane rotations. In fact, if it's a rigid object, how many degrees of freedom must it have? They better know the answer to this. Six, yes. Believe me, there's no trick questions and he knows what he's doing. So if he told you it's six, it really is six. There's no, no question there. Um, six, so sure, if this is a rigid object, in principle, there must be six degrees of freedom that describe it. Though, of course, you know, if it's my arm, then it's got more degrees of freedom. I wonder how many more it has. Anyway. Um, okay, so there's going to be a configuration space for this object, and ultimately, that's what we care about is, is that configuration space. The problem is that the image we get depends on this configuration space in some way. And so here I'm going to imagine for the moment that I can predict an image if I knew its configuration, if I knew the original image. And so you can imagine, this is like the forward kinematics of your robot. You know, I give you a kinematic structure and I give you some joint values and now you can say, aha, here is a new kinematic configuration for my object. So the problem then is, uh, I'm going to think of a tracking problem. So I know the initial configuration, I know the configuration at time t, I know the original image. Now what I'd like to do is to compute uh, the change in parameters, or even better, just the parameters themselves. I don't know what D stands for, so don't ask me what D stands for. Um, I want to compute the new configuration at time t plus 1 from the image at time t plus 1 and everything else I've seen. Or another way to think of this is, look, I said I believe I can predict the appearance of an object from 0 to t. I can also think of it the other way around. I can take the image at time t, and if I knew the configuration, I could predict what it would have looked like when we started, and now I can try to find the configuration that best explains the starting image. And so this really is effectively a stabilization problem. I'm going to try to pick a set of parameters that always make what I'm predicting 
look as close to the original template as possible. So in this case, I'm going to take the face and unrotate it and try to make it look like the original face. And so my stabilization point now is an image. And so this gives rise to a very natural sort of notion of tracking where I actually use my little model that I described, my prediction model, to take the current image, apply the current parameters, produce what's hopefully something that looks like the image of the object to start with. So if I started with my cell phone like this and later on it looks like that, I'm going to take that image, I'm going to resample it so hopefully it looks like that again. If it doesn't look like that, there's going to be some difference. I'm going to take that difference, run it through something. Hopefully that something will tell me a change in parameters. I'll accumulate this change in parameters and suddenly I've updated my configuration to be right. Now what's interesting about this, perhaps, let's just um, skip over this for the moment. So we can, for a planar object, we can use a very simple configuration, which turns out to be a so-called affine model. So how do I solve that stabilization problem? Well, again, I said I'm going to start out with this predictive model, which is kind of like your kinematics. And if I want to go from a kinematic description talking about positions in space to velocities in space, what do I use? Jacobian, imagine that. Hey, we've got, you know, kinematics in the rigid body world. We've also got kinematics in image space. Let's take a Jacobian. If we take a Jacobian, we're now relating what? Changes in configuration space to changes in appearance. Just like the Jacobian in robotics relates changes in configuration space to changes in Cartesian position. So there you go. So I'm going to take a Jacobian. It's going to be a very big Jacobian. So the number of pixels in the image might be 10,000. So my, I'm going to have 10,000 rows and however many configurations. So 10,000 by 6. So it's a very big Jacobian, but it's Jacobian nonetheless. And we know how to take those. Well, now I've got a way of relating change in parameter to change in the image. Suppose I measure an error in the image, which is kind of locally like a change in the image. So an error in the, in the alignment. Well, suppose I effectively invert that Jacobian. Now again, I have to use a pseudo-inverse because I got this big tall matrix instead of a square matrix. Well, so I take this incremental error that I've seen in my alignment, go backwards through the Jacobian, and lo and behold, it gives me a change in the configuration. And so I close the loop by literally doing an inverse Jacobian. In fact, it's the same thing you could use to control your robot to a position in Cartesian space through the Jacobian. Really no difference. So it really is a set point control problem. Um, again, I won't go into details. Right now, this is a huge, big time varying Jacobian. It turns out that you can show, and this is work that we did, and, and um, uh, um, name slips my mind, CMU also did work showing that you can make this essentially a time invariant system, which is just a way of implementing things very fast. What does a Jacobian look like? Well, the cool thing about images is you can look at Jacobians because they are images. So this is actually what uh, the columns of my Jacobian look like. So this is the Jacobian, if you look at the image, for a change in x direction, motion in x. And it kind of makes sense. You see it's basically getting all the changes in the image along the, the rows, or yeah, along the rows. Y is getting a change along the columns. Rotation is kind of getting this velocity field in this direction, so on and so forth. So that's what a Jacobian looks like if you never saw a Jacobian before. Um, it turns out that I had, what I showed you is for planar objects, you can do this for 3D. So my nose sticks out a lot. If I were to just kind of view my face as a photograph and I go like this, it doesn't quite work right. So I can deal with 3D by just adding some terms to this Jacobian. And in fact, you'll notice you know, what can I say? I've got a big nose, and so that's what comes out in the Jacobian of my face, is my nose. Tells you which direction my face is pointed. Um, again, we can deal with illumination, and uh, this is actually probably a little more interesting. I can also deal with occlusion while I'm tracking, because if I start to track my cell phone, and I go like this, well, lo and behold, there's some pixels that don't fit the model. So what I do is I add a little so-called reweighting loop that just detects the fact that some things are now out of sync 
ignore that part of the image. So you put it all together and you get something that looks not like that. So uh, just so you know what you're seeing, remember I said this is a stabilization problem. So if I'm tracking something right, I should be stabilizing the image. I should be subtracting all the changes out. So that little picture in the middle is going to be my stabilized face. I'm going to start by tracking my face. And this is actually the big linear system I'm solving, my Jacobian, which actually includes motion and includes some illumination components too, which I didn't talk about. So I'm just showing you uh, the Jacobian. You can kind of see a little frame flashing. This is a badly made video. It was back when I was young and uninitiated. And so now you can see I've, I'm running the tracking. This is just using planar tracking. So you, as I tip my head back and forth and move around, it's doing just fine. Uh, scale is just fine because I'm computing all the configuration parameters that have to do with distance. Um, I'm not accounting for facial expression, so I can still make goofy faces and they come through just fine. Uh, now I'm saying to an unseen partner, turn on the lights. And so I think some lights flash on and off. Yep, there we go. So it's just showing, you can actually model those changes in illumination that we talked about in stereo too, um, through some magic that only I know and I'm not telling anyone. <laughs> At least no one in this room. So actually it's not hard. It turns out that for uh, an object like your face, if you just take about a half a dozen pictures under different illuminations, and use that as a, a linear basis for illumination, that'll work just fine for illumination model. Notice here that I'm turning side to side though, and it clearly doesn't know anything about 3D. So uh, you can actually make my nose grow like Pinocchio by just doing the right thing. So I just let this run a little long. Okay, so now what I did is I put in the 3D model. And so the interesting thing now is you see my nose is stock still. So I actually know enough about the 3D geometry of the face in 3D configurations that I'm canceling all of the configuration, all the changes due to configuration out of the image. As a side effect, I happen to know where I'm looking too. So if you look at the back side, I'm telling you at any point in time what direction the face is looking. And uh, here I'm just kind of pushing it. Eventually, as you start to get occlusions, it starts to break down, obviously, because I haven't modeled occlusions. And I wish I could fast forward this, but it's before the days of fast forwarding. And my face is falling apart. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> it happens. It's uh, faculty at Yale saying, hey, what are you doing? Uh, and this is just showing the, what happens if you don't deal with occlusion in vision. You can see that I'm kind of knocking this thing out and it comes back and then eventually it goes kaboom. And now we're doing that occlusion detection. So I'm saying, hey, what things match and what things don't match. And uh, there you go, cup, sees a cup, says that's not a face. <laughs> so you can take these ideas and you can then push them around in lots of different ways. Um, this is actually using 3D models. Uh, here we're actually tracking groups of individuals and regrouping them dynamically as things go on. Um, here is probably the most extreme case. So this is actually tracking two da Vinci tools during a surgery. Uh, where we learned the appearance of the tools, actually, as we started. So there's um, 18 degrees of freedom in this system. So it's actually tracking in an 18 degree of freedom configuration space uh, during the surgery. Okay, very last thing. I have 10 minutes. I'm racing for home now. So I, uh, I can track <coughs> stuff. Cool. So what? Uh, it's fun. But... Um, the thing I said I wanted to do eventually was to finally manipulate something. I want to use all this visual information and I want to pick up the stupid cell phone and call my friends and say the vision lecture is finally over in robotics so you can go out and do something else. But the question is, how do I want to do that? So I, I've got cameras. They're producing all sorts of cool information. I've got a robot that I want to make drive around. Where do I drive it to or how do I drive it? So. What should I put in that box? Any suggestions? You can assume I've got, I've got two cameras. So I've got stereo. I've got pretty much anything you've seen. What's anybody think of a, I don't care which way you want to think of it. What could you put in that box? 
What information would you use and what would you put in the box? It's going to be on the midterm. Oh, look. The simplest thing you can imagine, right, is I've got, if I said I've got two cameras, I can actually, with those two cameras, measure a point in space. I can actually calibrate those cameras to the robot. And so I could just say, hey, go to this point in space. End of story. Good thing? Bad thing? Good or bad thing? Anybody think of why it could be good or bad? Yeah? It's bad because if you run into anything on the way, then you can't really accommodate for that. Right. So, okay, you're not monitoring. If I could monitor in real time, right? So that would get rid of at least that problem. What if my robot's not a real stiff robot? What if my kinematics aren't great? Like, it turns out the Da Vinci kinematics aren't that great. So I could reach out to a point in space, but maybe my arm goes here or there instead. Right? So the cameras are telling me to go somewhere, but it's not really closing the loop. So what if I do one better? What if I compute the position of my finger, track it, let's say, and I compute the position of the phone in 3D space? Now I can actually close the loop. I can say, I want to make this distance zero, and we could write down a controller that would actually do that. Pick your favorite controller. I know Osama has some ideas of what they should be, but pick your favorite. So, and that will work. In fact, that'll work pretty darn well, it turns out. But, suppose that my cameras are miscalibrated. And in fact, suppose that I say, well, what I want you to do is to go along a line defined by the edge of the cell phone. I want you to be here for some reason. Turns out you can show that if you do it in position space, in reconstructed space, and your cameras aren't perfectly calibrated, you can actually get errors. You can, in fact, you can get arbitrary errors if you want to. It's not real likely, but it can happen. So there's one other possibility, which is I'm looking at this thing, and I'm looking at this thing. What if I close the loop in the image space? What if I just write my controller on the image measurements themselves? Well, it turns out if you do that, and what this is called, it's called an encoding. So if you can encode the task you want to do, like touch this point of the cell phone to my finger and do it in the image space, not in the reconstructed space, well, you've defined an error that doesn't mention calibration, right? It just says, make these two things co-incident in the images. If you can close that loop stably, think of Jacobian again, for example, um, you can actually drive the system to a particular point, and you've never said anything about calibration in your error function, which means that even if the cameras are miscalibrated, you go there. And in fact, there's pretty good evidence that's what you do. You don't sit there and try to figure out the kinematics of your arm and the, the position in space and then kind of close your eyes and say, go there. You're watching, right? And you're actually using visual space. And we know this because I can put funny glasses on your eyes, and after a while, you still get pretty good at getting your fingers together. So um, again, I'm running out of time. I won't go into great detail. But the interesting question is really, when can you do this encoding? When can I write things down in the image domain? And the answer, again, depends a little bit on what you mean by cameras. But suffice to say, you can do a set of interesting tasks just by doing things in the image space and closing the loop in the image space. And the interesting fact is that a lot of sort of tasks that you might imagine, like putting a screwdriver in a screw or, or putting a disk in a disk drive, you can write it all in the image space and you don't need to calibrate the cameras or you don't need well calibrated cameras. And I'll have to say, so this is, how, why did I ever get into this? Because I was sitting in this stupid lab at Yale and I started to do this tracking, and just for the heck of it, I built this robot controller to do vision. So you see I'm tracking and I'm controlling here. And um, like the usual cynical young faculty member, I never expected this thing to work the first time. I hadn't calibrated the cameras. I just guessed what the calibration was. You know, I just threw the code together. And I turned this thing on, and it worked. And I mean, it worked within a half a millimeter. It wasn't like it just worked. It was right. And then I started to think about it and I realized, of course it worked. I didn't need to calibrate the cameras. And so then we actually spent the next few years figuring out why it was that I could get this kind of accuracy out of a system 
where I literally put the cameras down on the table, looked at it and said, I think they're about a foot apart, and ran the system. And this is, you know, the moral equivalent of that. So it's out there doing some stuff. And, you know, I'm doing the moral equivalent of pulling your eye out of your head and moving it over here and saying, okay, see if you can still do whatever you were doing. And, uh, you know, just to prove you can do useful things with it, we had to actually do something with the floppy. So there you go. You can also see how long ago this was by the, the form factor of the Macintosh that I'm putting the floppy disk into. Anyway, all right, so I'm about out of, out of time, but I hope what I've convinced you of is that at least a lot of these basic capabilities we've got. You know, we've got stereo, real time, gross geometry. We can recognize objects, we can recognize places, we can build maps out of it. We can track things, and we even know how to close loops in a way that are, are robust, so we don't have to worry about having finely tuned vision systems to make it work. So why aren't we running around with robots, you know, playing baseball with each other? Well, you know, I've given you kind of the, the simple version of the world. Obviously, if I give you complex geometry, objects you haven't seen before, it's not clear we really know how to pick up a random object that we're hopefully getting close. A lot of the world is deformable, it's not rigid. What's the configuration space? How do I talk about tracking it or manipulating it? And a lot of things are somewhere in between, you know, rigid objects on a tray, which, yes, I could turn it like this, but it really doesn't accomplish the, uh, the purpose in mind. So understanding those physical relationships. Uh, in the real world, there's a lot of complexity to the environment. It's not my cell phone sitting on an uncluttered desk, it's well, my desk would be, I'd be happy if it were that uncluttered. Uh, and I'm telling you to go and find something on it, manipulate it. So complexity is still a huge issue. And it's not just complexity in terms of what's out there. It's complexity and what's going on. People walking back and forth and up and down. Things changing, things moving. So imagine trying to build a map when people are moving through the corridors all the time. Oh, that's good. It can't. There's some movie I can't prepare. And uh, in fact, again, I know um, this is something of interest here, human-computer interaction. You know, I can track people, so now in principle I can reach out and touch people. What's the safe way to do it? When do I do it? How do I do it? What am I trying to accomplish by doing so? How do you actually take these techniques but add a layer which is really social interaction and safe uh, social interaction to the top of it? And I don't know if you've noticed, but I think these are not just uh, you know, there's a, a research aspect to it, but there's also a, a market aspect to it. At what point does it become interesting to do it? You know, what's the first killer app for actually picking things up and moving it around? It's cool to do it, but can you actually make money at it? And then the last thing, and I, at the beginning I said this, you know, the real question is, when are you going to be able to build a system where you don't pre-program everything? You know, it's one thing to program it to pick up my cell phone, it's another to program it to pick up stuff. And then at some point, have it learn about cell phones and say, go figure out how to pick up this cell phone and do it safely. And by the way, don't scratch the front because it's made out of glass. So again, there's a lot of work going on. But I think this is really the place where I have to stop and say, I have no idea how we're going to solve those problems. I know how to solve the problems I've talked about so far. But I think this is where really things are um, really open-ended. And there are a lot of cross-cutting challenges of just building complex systems and putting them together so they work. So uh, I'll just close then by saying, you know, the interesting thing is all of this that I've talked about is getting more and more real. Um, this chart, I'll just tell you, is uh, dating myself. But I built my first visual tracking system in my last year of grad school because I wanted to get out and I needed to get something done. And it ran on something called the Microvax 2, and it ran at, I think, 10 hertz on a machine that cost 20,000 bucks. So it cost me about $2,000 a cycle to get visual tracking to work. And so I still have that algorithm today, in fact. And I just kept running it as I got new machines. So those numbers are literally dollars per hertz, dollars per cycle of vision that I could get out of the system. And so it went from $2,000 till when I, I finally got tired of doing it about seven years ago, when it was down to 20 cents a hertz. So, you know, literally for pocket change, I could have visual tracking up and running. So, you know, all the vectors are pointed in the right way in terms of technology. 
knowledge. I think we've learned a lot in the last decade. I mean, it's cool to live now and see all of this stuff that's actually happening. I think the real challenge is putting it together. So if you look at an interesting set of objects and an interesting set of tasks, like be my workshop assistant, which is something I proposed about seven years ago at ICRA, that you could actually build something that would literally go out and say, aha, I recognize that screwdriver, and he said he wanted the big screwdriver, so I'll pick that up and I'll put it on the screw or I'll hand it to him or whatever. And oh, I've never seen this thing before, but I can at least figure out enough to pick it up and hand that over and say, what is this? And when he says it's a, a pliers, um, I'll know what it is. So I think the pieces are there is the interesting message. Um, but nobody has put it together yet. And so maybe uh, one of you will be one of the people to do so. So um, I think I'm out of time. And I think I've covered everything I said I would cover. So if there are any questions, I'll take questions, including after uh, class. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you so much.